Hi, thank you so much, Ted, for <clears throat> this wonderful uh, in, uh, introduction and uh, for this series, which I am um, having such a great time moderating and inviting my friends to uh, uh, talk about the Babylonian Talmud. So just a few words about the context of the series and how this uh, lecture really fits into it. The, the idea of this series is to talk about what is the Talmud, what is the Babylonian Talmud. And we look at it from different angles. And I invited really the best, the top scholars, cutting edge scholarship, brand new scholarship to talk about the Talmud, but from this really new critical thinking that we find in the academic sphere today about the Talmud and really demonstrate and show the richness that new uh, scholarship can really offer to the study of this important and fascinating text. We started with the first lecture by Professor Muli Vidas from Princeton University. We talked about the composition of the Talmud, what is it made of, how it was created. Uh, and the second lecture was for Professor Christine Hayes from Yale University that talked about the content of this text and the laws. Uh, how did the rabbinic law differ from biblical law and what did the rabbi try to do in this incredible project. Today, uh, Shai is going to talk to us about the context and we'll talk about it in a second. How did the Talmud, how, what's the environment in which the Talmud was created? Zoroastrian, Persian, Christian, all kinds. So this is what we will we'll ta be talking about today. And the last lecture, and here I'm going to be giving a promo for our next week. Next week, we will be talking to Professor Chaim Weiss from Ben Gurion University here in Israel, talking about the genre of literature, the stories of the Talmud, and um, what, it, what it meant to do within the Talmud. So uh, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. So Shai is a, is a dear friend, and he is a graduate of Yeshiva University, where he wrote his PhD. He had postdocs uh, in uh, very high and prestigious uh, postdocs at Yale University and Hebrew U. And he's been uh, a chair, a professor uh, at Bard College since 2016. He wrote an influential and groundbreaking books. Uh, one called the Iranian Talmud, reading the Bavli in its Sasanian context that was published by UPenn in 2014. And the second, brand new, the Talmud's Red Fence, Menstruation and Difference in the Babylonian Judaism in its Sasanian context by Oxford University Press, 2020, uh, a year ago. Uh, and I'm honored and excited to uh, 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 really have you here, Shai, talking to us. As, as always, Shai will give a short lecture and talk about uh, the Talmud's context. And afterwards, we will open the floor to questions. You're welcome to write questions in the chat and I will moderate them and ask uh, and, and, and create a conversation with uh, Shai uh, about those questions. And I look forward to talking and hearing from Shai about the context of the Talmud. So Shai, your, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I, of course, I wanna open with thanks to Professor Barashir Sigal for this invitation to be part of I think a great forum on what is the Talmud to also share the floor with um, amazing colleagues, including our host and the speakers. So thank you so much to you and also to the um, National Library of Israel for, uh, for inviting me. What I'd like to do is, let me first share my screen. What I would like to do is begin a conversation. There's really too much to cover uh, in trying to situate the Talmud uh, in its context, but at least to begin a conversation about not only what the Talmud is made of, which you heard about from Professor Vidas, not only about questions of divine law, of literary uh, theory, as, you, as you've heard and you'll hear in the subsequent le lectures, but also the world, or in fact, the worlds of, uh, of the Talmud. I want to introduce it by kind of focusing on this iconic page um, of the Talmud as published in the 19th century uh, in Vilna, the Vilna Shas, of course, um, and to sort of meditate on the relationship between the Talmud and the black space uh, beyond it. But the Talmud itself is a highly complex, um, uh, intricate uh, text. In fact, it's so intricate that sometimes there's the sense that it's the only thing in the room. Um, as if it you know, was produced in a vacuum, is engaged just as the text itself, uh, but it's not part of a broader context or um, a set of world, a world or a set of worlds. 
Now, in introducing the Talmud this way and trying to begin to think about the context of the Talmud, I want to open with a contrast. And the contrast is this very messy, intentionally messy slide. What you're looking at here are different ways that scholars for decades, in fact, centuries, have spoken about the context of texts from the land of Israel, from Palestinian rabbinic texts, uh, including the Talmud Yerushalmi, right? The Babylonian Talmud sort of sister, old sister um, text. We have archeological evidence, we have art, we have lots of texts written by Jews and non-Jews that must contextualize, say, the Palestinian Talmud. Uh, we have inscriptions, et cetera, et cetera. And yet when it comes to the Talmud, it, it seems as if it's the only thing in the room. So what I wanna do is introduce you to four, especially three worlds that I think um, we need to situate the Talmud in. Again, we'll only begin the conversation now in my lecture, and then I'm happy to continue the discussion um, in, the, uh, in the discussion part of this, uh, this lecture. Um, but, but the goal is, is really to deny this sense that the Talmud is sort of this self-enclosed world, but rather acknowledge the fact that it, like every text, um, is part of a set of worlds, in fact, very vibrant uh, worlds indeed. The four contexts that I want to think about, uh, and I will focus on three of them, um, the different worlds, I should say, are, first of all, the worlds of rabbinic Judaism as it existed in the land of Israel. So as I mentioned, it's not just the Babylonian Talmud, but we also have the Palestinian Talmud. And then I want to really focus on three um, immediately local worlds, and those are the political context, the interreligious context, that is the relationship between the rabbis who created the Talmud in Babylonia and different religious groups uh, in the Sasanian Empire, the name of the empire uh, in which the Talmud was composed. And finally, the last world would be the world of Jews, but non-rabbinic Jews who are living in, uh, in Babylonia. So let's open with a map of late antiquity. Um, the, the period in time during which the Talmud and rabbinic literature uh, in general was, uh, was composed. So if you're able to see my cursor here, here we have uh, the land of Israel, we have Jeru Jerusalem. In fact, the texts of the um, of, of, of Palestinian rabbinic literature were composed a little bit to the north of Jerusalem, uh, primarily in the Galilee. And then to the east, we have Babylonia, right? Modern day uh, Iraq. Uh, these spaces are part of a much wider world. Uh, this uh, map, if it was a better one, uh, would also give you an indication of points further east. But at least here, we can appreciate, um, first of all, the fact that Jews uh, lived and flourished throughout um, the Mediterranean basin and, and beyond their late antiquity. And rabbinic Jews were centered in, in between these two places, Northern Israel, and, um, and Babylonia uh, and present day Iraq. So the first context that I'll mention, but I won't focus on, which is necessary in situating the Talmud uh, among worlds is the world of rabbinic Judaism as it existed in the land of Israel uh, and its relationship to what was happening in Babylonia. Uh, the, the commuters, right? The two-way traffic between these centers, the traditions that moved from Palestine to Babylonia and back from Babylonia to Palestine are part of, uh, are part of the vibrant world, one important world, even central world for understanding the Talmud. What I do want to focus on instead are things that are immediately local, that are, that are relevant for understanding the Talmud as it, um, as it came to be crystallized. Um, in Babylonia. And I'm going to open with a political context. So what we're looking at here, especially during late antiquity, um, from points west is the Roman Empire, a very well-known empire, uh, a superpower on the wane ultimately would be, um, the center of power would be re relocated uh, to Byzantium. But regardless, the Western, um, the Western part of the late antique Jewish expanse, including uh, rabbinic Judaism as it existed in, in Israel, was part of the Roman Empire. 
On the other hand, the Jews in Babylonia, including the rabbis who produced the Talmud, were part of a different political entity, actually a political entity that was often uh, in competition and sometimes at war uh, with the Roman Empire. And here I'm referring to the Sasanian Empire. The Sasanian Empire is a empire dynasty that began in southwestern Iran, came to power at the beginning of the third century, around 224, 226, um, and interestingly enough, lasted more or less throughout what we call the Talmudic period. So it begins with the earliest rabbis, Talmudic rabbis, Amoraim in Babylonia at the beginning of the third century. And this is when the Sasanian Empire um, uh, it disappears from the world stage with the Arab conquests in the seventh century. So the Babylonian Talmud by that point seems to have been completed. Um, has crystallized as a, as a text, and then we move into another period, both in world history uh, and in um, uh, and in Jewish literary history. Right, we go from the Talmudic period to the Goanic period. So, in thinking about this political context, I want to point out a few things. First of all, we often hear echoes of the relationship between the rabbis and uh, the Sasanian kings. Here's a favorite example of mine, uh, a passage from Tractate Sukkah. We hear about Shmuel, a very important early Amora, first generation Amora, who lived actually at the time when the Sasanians came to power. We have this report that Shmuel juggled in front of King Shapur with eight cups of wine. Now, there's a lot that you can do with just this little line. Uh, first of all, uh, you can contemplate the historicity of this report. Uh, is this meant to be a historically accurate depiction of a rabbi actually in you know, the highest halls of power juggling in front of a king? Uh, and that is a question that should be dealt with. Most scholars would think that this is not uh, a historically accurate report. However, what is important is what it can tell us culturally, what the rabbis made of the relationship with the kings uh, and how they saw themselves as, um, as interfacing uh, with these kings. So Shmuel, right, this great sage, uh, is juggling, is engaging in forms of court leisure and court culture, which we actually have depicted um, in various works of art from the Sasanian period. Uh, and he's doing it, it seems, as a sign of respect, as some show of obeisance to, uh, to the king. In thinking about the political context, though, um, as we know, uh, unfortunately, especially as I'm giving this lecture, political context is not always just fun and games. In fact, it often involves war um, and death. Uh, and we also have echoes of that in, in the Talmud. So I want to look very briefly at one Talmudic text that gives us a window into this side of the political context, uh, a world in which the rabbis are witnessing wars between empires, uh, and they're also trying to weigh in and kind of hedge their bets as to who will win or who should win uh, these, uh, these battles between, in this case, the Roman Empire and the Sasanian Persian uh, Empire. The text begins as follows. Said Rabbi Yoshua, son of Levi, in the name of Rebbe. And this is coming from rabbis in the land of Israel. Again, right, we begin with that world, right, the world of uh, Palestinian rabbinic Judaism. In the future, Rome will fall at the hand of the Persians. As it says, and he quotes a verse, which we won't get into now, but is taken to mean uh, that, again, Rome will be the victim um, of, of Persian imperialism. Rav, right, a important early uh, Babylonian sage interlocutor actually of Shmuel, who we just met, says something shocking in the other direction. Rav said, in the future, Persia will fall at the hands of Rome. Rav Gahana and Rav Asi said to Rav, this is horrified, builders in the hand, hands of destroyers. The Persians in Jewish memory right, had a reputation as builders. They allowed the second temple uh, to be built. Uh, on the other hand, the Rome, Rome, as is well known, um, is an empire that's associated with destruction, destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple. So is it just, how could it be that the builders, the Persians, in your view of the future, Rav, uh, will fall into the hands of the destroyers? Two versions of what he responds, he responded to them, it is a decree of the king, meaning your argument is correct. Um, if 
things were just, if things were as they should be, then in fact, um, Rome would fall into the hands of the Persians. However, for reasons that we don't understand expressed by um, the Hebrew Bible, this is what God decreed. Or another explanation is they too are also destroyers of synagogue, meaning that the Persians were not seen, at least by uh, Babylonian Jews at some point in their history, uh, as, uh, as only builders. They too are destroyers and therefore they can fall into um, the hands of the Romans. Now, what I wanted to show in this passage, first of all, uh, is that there was a political context. There was a quite dramatic uh, and violent political context that Babylonian Jews, the rabbis of the Talmud, were thinking about, were dealing with. And again, we're trying to sort of hedge uh, who, would, who would win and who would not. You can see an image in the left uh, of, in fact, um, a victory uh, of the Sasanians over the Romans, where King Shapur uh, tramples on Gordian III, the Roman, um, and this is depicted in a dramatic relief uh, uh, in Iran. Before moving on from the political context, I want to show how the rabbis were participating in sort of broader efforts to make sense, to make religious sense of, um, of the dramas of war and the movement of history during this period. So we can see um, here we have a, a, an artifact, a religious artifact that um, was built, was produced by a Zoroastrian. We'll soon be Zoroastrians in a second. But for the time being, just know that the Zoroastrians um, were a, um, is an ancient Iranian religion. That Durasanian period was closely aligned, very closely aligned with the Sasanian state. So in this fire altar, and fire was the primary worship, um, object of veneration uh, in Zoroastrianism, we have an inscription that also weighs in, in terms that are quite similar to, the, um, uh, to what we found in the Talmud. I won't read all of this, I'll just refer very briefly to an important part, but this fire altar was established looking from the third line, when in the year three of Shapur, king of, king of kings, when the Romans were coming against Persia and Parthia, then I was here in a place called All Happy Frayosh. Then when it was heard that the Romans were coming, then I entreated the gods saying, if Shapur, the king of kings is victorious and the Romans are smitten and worsted, so that they fall into our captivity, our captivity, that I shall allow myself to establish a fire here. And in fact, then, this is all part of the inscription, when it was heard that the Romans had come and Shapur the king of kings had smitten them and had worsted them so that they fell into our captivity, then I began to establish a fire and its name was made long live Shapur and Abnon, the name of the person who commissioned this object. So we have different voices. In the case of the rabbis, uh, a minority community that was not closely aligned with the state, but had to sort of figure out the relationship with the state and also predict to the best of their abilities what would happen in these very um, uh, consequential uh, wars and battles. And on the other hand, in an object like we have in front of us, we have an inscription uh, produced by a Zoroastrian, closely aligned with the state. He uses the royal we, uh, or I should say the 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 first person, the 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 first person plural, to refer to the victory that ultimately um, causes him to establish this um, uh, this this fire altar. So. To sum up the, first, the second world that I've referred to, there one crucial world for understanding the Babylonian Talmud and denying the fact that it was produced in some kind of black vacuum uh, is the political world, is the world of the Sasanian Empire, is the wars between Rome um, and, and that empire, and is also the work that the, that the Jews had to do, the rabbis had to do, in positioning themselves uh, to the best of their abilities uh, within this political space. I want to move on to another world. Uh, that is the world that we'll spend most of the time uh, discussing, religious world, right? What was the religious context uh, of the Babylonian Talmud? And to do this, I want to open with the uh, inscription um, that was commissioned by a Zoroastrian high priest uh, in the third century of the Common Era. 
Again, I mentioned that Zoroastrianism is an ancient Iranian religion. It's a religion that is closely aligned, was closely aligned with the Sasanian state. Uh, and a case in point is the inscription in front of us, which is part of a larger imperial inscriptional context uh, in which this high priest who worked his way up over the course of his career um, in uh, quite high up in the political echelon in the Sasanian empire, how he thinks about this um, heterogeneous interreligious space and how he mentions the different uh, communities, the different religious communities that lived in the Sasanian empire and some of whom lived in proximity and even interfaced with the Jews, right? The Babylonian Jews in this case um, that we're interested in. So if you look just for C, uh, we, we hear about his boast of having um, persecuted or at least harmed different religious um, communities. That's not a positive, happy way to be introduced to the different religious communities, but it is a way to hear about them. And I just wanna focus on this list here. So he mentions that Jews and shamans and Brahmins, these probably refer to what we in our modern anachronistic categories we refer to as Buddhists and Hindus in the Eastern part of the empire and not normally in uh, interfacing with Babylonian Jews. But then as we continue, we hear about Nazarenes and Christians and Baptists and Manichaeans who were struck in the empire. So in this line, we get a, a, a picture of a diverse um, interreligious space where we don't only have Jews, whom interestingly enough start the list, uh, but also we hear about apparently different groups of Christians. Um, Baptists, these are religious groups who their central religious rite um, was uh, immersion in, in water, cleansing, ritual cleansing in water, probably a reference, likely a reference to the Mandeans, uh, a religious group that we won't spend much time discussing, and the Manichaeans, a dualistic religion that actually was founded uh, in Babylonia by a prophet named Mani in the third century. Now, I want to work through just a few of these religious groups, again, to give you a sense of this world, this set of worlds that the Babylonian Talmud uh, was composed in, that the interreligious world. Okay, so let's start with the Zoroastrians. We hear about the Zoroastrians um, quite a bit in the Talmud. Sometimes um, we are we, we learn of Persians, uh, and Persians often were, or we can assume were Zoroastrians, but sometimes we even have a term that indicates that we're dealing with um, people who are Zoroastrian, not just um, by basic identification, but in some kind of official capacity, essentially serving as priests. And here we have a little story uh, that depicts a dialogue between a rabbi and a Zoroastrian priest. And this is how it goes. A certain magus said to a Maimar, a Maimar was a relatively late Talmudic sage, from your waist upwards is of Hormuz, from your waist downwards is of Arima. So the Zoroastrian priest says, points to a Maimar and he says, the upper part of your body is associated with Hormuz, or Mast, this is the good spirit in Zoroastrianism, the main deity um, who is the object of, of worship, the direction of worship. And from your waist down, that more negative space uh, in, this, um, in this theology is of Ahriman. Ahriman is the evil spirit in Zoroastrianism. And we'll see in just a second how this wasn't some kind of amorphous force of the world, but actually had real world um, representatives, um, evil representatives uh, in, um, in reality. Now, the Talmud's not gonna let that piece of Zoroastrian theology sit. Uh, so a Maimar response, a Maimar said to the, in response, if so, how does Ahriman, how does the evil spirit let Hormuz, the good spirit, pass urine through his land? Meaning the body cannot really be divided so strictly. There is, there is a, um, a working relationship between the two parts of the body. And therefore your theology, your strongly dualistic theology uh, is out of place. You can't divide the world between the good spirit or and the evil spirit uh, Ahriman. 
Now, the picture in front of you is a picture not unlike the one we saw earlier when I was discussing politics, where we have a Zoroastrian, a Sasanian king, uh, in fact, the first one, Ardashir the first, who is trampling his worldly enemy. Uh, and then we have a divine depiction of Ormazd, right, that good god, who is simultaneously trampling Arima, that evil spirit. So this was a very real world theology that one could, do, could divide the world uh, into good and evil, into entities that are associated with Ormazd, the good spirit and the evil spirit. This context, right, where the rabbis had to sort of think through dualism, which had political implications, but of course had theological implications, was part of the world of the Talmud. And is something that we need to think about when we want to position the Talmud in its world. Part of the question of uh, dualism that I'll just mention briefly um, is not only a difference between uh, the rabbis and Zoroastrians, but actually it's a point of contact. Um, Zoroastrianism, just like rabbinic Judaism, is very, very interested in questions of ritual purity, right? Things like corpse impurity, menstrual impurity. They, these entities are seen as problematic, negative, and need to be managed. That managing is often through a kind of scholastic engagement, asking questions about whether this thing, this object, this person is impure or not impure, and sometimes quite sophisticated uh, questions. So in the example, uh, a Zoroastrian text considers whether someone who converted but had purified themselves prior to their conversion to Zoroastrianism, uh, whether that purification process uh, is in effect or not. Sounds like a rather rabbinic question. So we can see on the one hand, the dualism that um, is so important in Zoroastrianism was a dividing line between Judaism and Zoroastrianism. We find depictions of dialogues and, um, uh, uh, and disputation about that, but also it's a, it's a shared discursive space. It's a place where um, it creates a question of dualistic question of pure and impure that rabbis and Zoroastrian priests engage in similar ways. I want to move on to another religious activity. We won't cover all of them, but I want to briefly mention Syriac Christianity. In Kurdir's inscription that we saw just a few minutes ago, he mentions Christians, perhaps even a couple of Christian groups that lived and actually thrived uh, in the empire. Syriac Christians and Syriac Christianity is another really important um, world to consider when trying to locate the, uh, the, the Babylonian Talmud in its context for a number of reasons. First of all, many Christians, in fact, the dominant community of Christians, um, spoke Syriac, a, 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 an Eastern Aramaic language that was quite close to the language of Babylonian Jews, Babylonian Jewish Aramaic. Uh, and they also had a shared um, scripture. Um, for most of them, uh, the Hebrew Bible, what they refer, what, what now is referred by Christians to as the Old Testament, um, was shared with Jews, at least the, the text themselves. But the question of how to interpret them uh, became uh, a site of contest, a site of a disputation. So an example that I wanted to just raise here is based on the research um, of Professor Naomi Colton from, um, which looks at a fourth century sage, um, Mesopotamian sage, uh, Christian sage, I should say, church father, living in some proximity to the rabbis. Um, and you can see the text, the kinds of questions he deals with, and also the kinds of proof texts he uses uh, to figure out the best path. So here he's talking about the importance of celibacy, right, virginity and a kind of Christian holiness. And he brings proof texts uh, to show that celibacy is an ideal from the giving of the Torah, right, on Mount Sinai, where not, where, first of all, the Israelites are told, the Israelite men are told to separate themselves from their wives. And in fact, Moses um, uh, seems to have lived a life at some point as a celibate. The rabbis and Babylonian Jews also had to resist this. Uh, 
example, a text where they're quoting the same um, same verses, same material from that shared Hebrew Bible, but using it in a different way. So another interreligious inter uh, context to take into account is the Syriac Christian one, um, not only because there was a shared language, uh, but also because there's a shared uh, biblical heritage and other points of contact between them. Very briefly, I wanna mention the Manichaeans, um, uh, especially because of questions of geography. Mani, uh, was a Babylonian prophet. He grew up in a sect that we could call a Judeo-Christian sect. Uh, that doesn't mean he liked Jews. In fact, he, had, he did not like Jews uh, at all. Um, but he founded a religion that was also part of the, con con um, the complex interreligious space in which the Talmud was, was found. I'll give you one example in which we seem to see uh, if not direct reference to Manichaeism, um, a kind of dialogue that would have affected the Talmud. And that is uh, Manichaeism's uh, ideas about the importance of the book, uh, the importance of the written word, uh, which actually he believed was greater, was more reliable, was more important than oral transmission. Now the Talmud in the world of the rabbis uh, was a world that was very much involved in orality, right? This was the study of the oral Torah, Torah Shabal Peh. Zoroastrians as well, um, who we just met, uh, also uh, venerated in a sense, the oral world, word, oral transmission. So Mani and Manichaeism seems to have brought some complexity, some dialogue, some dispute about the question of uh, whether religious text should be transmitted orally, um, should they not? He argued that all kinds of problems resulted from that, that transmission. Now, I want to close um, by referring to a final world. Uh, we talked about the world of Palestinian rabbinic Judaism. We spoke about the political context, the Sasanian um, dynasty, the Sasanian empire. We also talked about the interreligious world. I want to close by referring to the intra-religious world. And by that, I mean the world of Babylonian Jews who did not necessarily identify as rabbis, uh, who did not necessarily, um, uh, could have been at variance with the rabbis, but were still Jewish and were still part of this Jewish context. The best entry point into that is through what are referred to as the Aramaic incantation bolts. You have a nice example here from uh, Yale University. And these texts, many of which are written in the language uh, that um, uh, of the Babylonian Talmud, uh, were written by Jews, often include Jewish themes, but at the same time seem to give us a, a window into the world of Jews who were not always um, rabbinic Jews. This is a final world, word, world that I want to mention in thinking about the different worlds um, that um, made up the concept of Babylonian Talmud. Now, in closing with this world, world, I just want to um, note something that is relevant here, relevant for um, all of the worlds that we've thought about. And that is the interlocking nature of these different worlds. So the incantation bolts on the one hand seem to be a great source and they are a great source for thinking about um, non-rabbinic Jews. And yet, right, there's a kind of blurring of those boundaries because some of the bolts seem to involve rabbis. This is an example of a bowl that was written for rabbi. We have other examples of bolts like the one in front of you that seem to have texts that look very, very rabbinic, uh, such as uh, th this, this example. So in the case of the incantation world, in the case of thinking about non-rabbinic Judaism, we often find quite a bit of overlap, even spillover between one world and the other, right? Between a supposedly non-rabbinic world and the world of rabbinic Judaism. I think you could say the same thing about um, the inter-religious context, the world of you know, Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism, Syriac Christianity, Manichaeism, on the one hand is a different world. Uh, it's a world that one um, is sort of outside that of the rabbis, but there's often spillover uh, and the political context as well, uh, where uh, the rabbis could at least imagine a sage like Shmuel uh, juggling inside of the court. And of course, 
the rabbis and the Jews would have had to maneuver within that world of the Sasanian court. So I'd like to just close by um, suggesting everyone engage in a thought experiment or even to construct your own um, um, slide. Of what would happen if we actually acknowledge that the world of the Babylonian Talmud um, is not isolated, it's not a kind of dark vacuum where nothing isn't around, but what a complex slide like I produced about Palestinian rabbinic Judaism uh, would look like. Thanks so much. Glad to have begun this conversation. I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Shai. Thanks so much for your wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me, Shai? Yes. Yes. Wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. You. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, which are uh, a little bit about the clarification of a few of the terms that you mentioned before we move to the more biggest question. So some people ask what's a magus uh, and what's an incantation bull. So if you can explain those two terms before we move on to the larger question. Sure. So a magus is a term that's used um, for Zoroastrian priests. You might have heard of the uh, especially for those who are familiar with the New Testament, might have heard of uh, the Magi or familiar with classical um, classical literature. Uh, and these are uh, Zoroastrian priests. Uh, it's an old uh, Iranian term. It might even have originally referred to some kind of tribal identity. But during the Sasanian Empire, uh, during the Sasanian period, this was a this was a term that was used not only in Jewish texts to refer to uh, Zoroastrian priests. Um, incantation bowls uh, are bowls, uh, clay bowls, uh, that seem to date from something like the 5th until the 7th century of the Common Era, uh, basically the late and um, early post-Talmudic period. Uh, they um, are inscribed, as you saw in the image, often in spiral form. So they begin at the beginning of the bowl, in the middle of the bowl, and they spiral outwards. Sometimes they're depictions of chained demons in them. And the purpose of these incantation bowls is um, as amulets would be, uh, amulets for a house. They would offer magical protection, uh, usually, for people who place them in their home. Uh, it seems from the archeological evidence, they would be placed in different corners of the room or corners of the house. Uh, and they would function uh, very much like home amulets uh, uh, function. They're a great repository of material. Uh, the majority of the ones that we have are in Babylonian Jewish Aramaic, but there are also plenty of bowls in Syriac um, uh, and perhaps some other languages as well. Good, thank you. I want to stop for a second and ask, because really this is about the non-Jewish world of the time of the Talmud. And you gave us a few wonderful examples of, of, of specific texts, really, that uh, uh, once you understand the background, really shed light on it. But I want to ask you, really, a big question. Is this important? And why is it important, right? Why should uh, we study the Talmud in light of these texts? What, what, what has research taught us so far in this? I have to say that Chai is really one of the groundbreaking scholars of this, uh, the study of the Talmud in light of the Persian, and especially his book about menstruation, for example, uh, if you can say a little bit about that. But really, what has scholarship taught us knew that we couldn't have known otherwise just by learning about the non-Jewish background. What, why is this important to better understand the Talmud? Right, thank you. I mean, in a way you could also, uh, for those in the audience who don't know, uh, Professor Barshar Sigal is the author of a couple of books on uh, the importance of taking into account Christianity uh, in studying the Talmud. And you make some great arguments in your book about trying to understand and, and the importance of using this material to understand. Um, so I'll say a few things. After uh, all, just on the local level, right? Just on the sense of trying to make sense of specific passages, uh, knowing uh, non-Jewish texts, knowing um, 
uh, sorts of all sorts of evidence that are extra Talmudic is valuable in just decoding what we are reading in front of us. Take, for example, um, that little story about a Maymar and a Magus. Uh, originally, people kind of knew that it was about uh, a Persians and Zoroastrians. They thought it was sort of a funny text. They didn't really necessarily think it was very serious. Uh, but actually, uh, in time, we discovered that it was quite a serious text. We have a Middle Persian sort of echo or equivalent of that text that's not between a, um, a Jew uh, and a Zoroastrian, but rather is a disputation uh, that's held between two Persian speakers in front of the Abbasid Caliph um, in the ninth century. And they go through almost the exact same question, right? They ask, why do Zoroastrians wear uh, this belt that separates the top part of the body from the bottom? And they, and, and, and the respondent in that dispute goes into great detail explaining the theology what it means to associate the upper part of the body with Ormazd and the lower part of the body with Arimad. So in terms of like the local, on the local level, just being able to be aware of non-rabbinic texts, non-Jewish texts is valuable to understanding what it is that we're reading in front of us. But of course it goes much beyond that. Um, and what we're able to do is appreciate various developments, things that happen in the Talmud, um, even if a Christian, uh, a heretic, a Zoroastrian priest is not mentioned explicitly, but strange things seem to happen uh, which demand some kind of explanation. And often or sometimes that explanation uh, can be brought from non-Rabbinic texts. So I'll, since you mentioned the book, Michal, uh, I'll use that as an example. Uh, the, the laws of menstrual impurity, of course, are were and remain uh, important, uh, quite important in Jewish practice and Jewish belief. The rabbis in Babylonia did not invent uh, these rituals, these rules, but there are all kinds of strange developments uh, that take place in the Babylonian Talmud that make some kind of, um, of explanation. One would be the growing, almost extreme level of expertise what Professor Shalata von Robert has called blood science that develops specifically in the Babylonian Talmud. Now, of course, the rabbis always present themselves of ex as experts, halachic experts of all sorts, even in Palestinian rabbinic literature, even in earlier texts. But what we find in the Babylonian Talmud is the thing that's completely out of control. They reach a point where the Babylonian rabbis have created such a complex system, and they try to show that their system is better, more sophisticated, more intricate than any other system. By the way, including, uh, they even imagined that the Sasanian queen would come and consult them. What ends up happening is that they, they're too afraid even to continue doing this. A number of rabbis say, this is too much for me, I can't engage in this. So one of the explanations, something that I've, I've suggested, is it's the pressure from competition with Zoroastrians that have led to this very strange development. That because Zoroastrians also were invested um, in a ritual system involving menstrual impurity, and because Zoroastrians uh, presented themselves also as kind of experts, the rabbis had to show them that they're better, that they're more sophisticated, and they created a kind of stack of cards that ended up falling. So the second kind of area, and I think the most important gain that we have um, from consulting non-Jewish non literature uh, is not just to understand individual passages, but to understand all sorts of developments that take place in the Talmud, uh, which otherwise are, are, are puzzling. Great. Uh, I, we keep talking about, we're very Jewish centered, right? So we're interested in under, better understanding the Talmud in light of non-Jewish uh, uh, um, stories, texts, praxis, theology. Uh, you know, Persians, Christians, Manichaeans, you mentioned, etc., cetera, um, which is true because we're interested in asking the question, what is the Talmud? And we're, we're focused and we're coming at it from the Talmud. Both you and I are scholars of Talmud at the end of the day. But what can you tell us and what do we know about 
the relationship between Persians and Christians, for example. So uh, um, what about, you know, Manichaeans and Persians or the Romans and the Roman Empire and the on the and the uh, uh, Persian Empire. So, what do we know about the relationship between those religious minorities and 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 forces, political forces um, that don't necessarily involve the Jews or the Talmud? And how, That's right. by the way, and how does this influence you know the, what we do? Yes. So you're you're one hundred percent correct. I mean, sometimes, especially if we wear you know the hat of a Talmudist. Uh, or a Jewish studies professor, it's always about, you know, what does this mean for the Jews? It's kind of a scholarly uh, version of that terrible question, is it good or bad for the Jews, right? But actually, um, the, the kind of scholarship that one can do on the context of the Talmud, and even as it relates to the Talmud, is quite valuable for scholars who don't have a vested interest in Jewish studies, who aren't necessarily interested in what's happening with the Jews, but do want to better understand what's happening in late antiquity, what's happening specifically in the Sasanian Empire. Um, and the, the, the Talmud is sort of a great key or one of the keys for understanding the way a religious minority, uh, an interesting religious minority that's very kind of scholastically oriented, um, how they position themselves uh, in, in the empire. Now, as you suggested, one can do this and one should and must do this with all of the different religious groups and communities that um, evidence has survived uh, of their existence. So there's been really interesting work, for example, on the relationship between uh, Christians, especially the Syriac church and, um, and Zoroastrians. Uh, in fact, right, one could be Persian uh, and there was a growing number of ethnic Persians, people who spoke Persian language, who were becoming Christian. Uh, and this created very interesting tension between the ruling authorities uh, who had this idea that somehow Persian identity, Iranian identity more broadly, uh, was supposed to be Zoroastrian, right? Was supposed to be the sort of ancient kind of um, Iranian religious um, identity. What do we do now? So um, people in power asked this growing number of Persians, ethnic Persians, Persian speakers, who have adopted this religion, right, um, known as Christianity. Complicating matters even further is once Rome is Christianized in the fourth century, uh, questions need to be asked. What is the relationship between the Roman Empire, which sees itself not only as Christian, but a kind of protector of Christians in other places, and um, Christians living in the Sasanian Empire? Right. So there are fascinating questions that one needs to ask and that scholars are asking exactly as you suggested between these different these different communities and how they relate to one another. The, 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 the Babylonian Jewish community, as you know, as perhaps relatively unimportant it is uh, compared to kind of the big questions of uh, the society and court and the people in the power is actually supremely valuable. Um, not because just we care about the Jews, but because the, because the Talmud, as difficult as it is to extract um, historical data from it, the Talmud is a remarkable document that provides the kind of a, a, a level of material engagement that's really quite rare uh, in the source starved world of the Sasanian Empire. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions from uh, we got from at the chat from uh, people asking really uh, a lot of very interesting questions, some of them we, which we ad address. But uh, uh, Rafaela Turati asks, uh, I think she wants you to say more about purity and Zoroastrianism and what can we say about the similarities that we can see with Hinduism and uh, maybe even things that still we see until today. So what can you say a little bit more about um, uh, purity laws and I'm pushing you a little bit more towards your work and uh, please, Shai. Sure, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, purity, uh, questions of purity are quite, ritual purity are quite important in Zoroastrianism. Uh, these questions have a strong theological basis uh, in a, a vision of the world in which the pure is associated with uh, the good God, Ahura Mazda, uh, Or Mazd, uh, and the impure, especially uh, the impurity relating to things like 
uh, corpse impurity uh, or various bodily impurities are attributed to the evil spirit Ariman and his kind of intrusion uh, into uh, the world. So there's a strong theological basis for uh, the interest in impurity. And some of the earliest texts that we have um, from the Avesta, actually, uh, earliest Zoroastrian texts, BC are quite engaged. Uh, there's one text known as the Videvdad, uh, which translates as something law against the demon. And pure and pure as a kind of, uh, of the demons. There's quite a bit that you can say uh, in terms of is my internet cutting out? Yep, I just a got a. Bit. Uh, yep. Am I back bit. though? You're okay. back. It's good. Okay, so um, there's also quite a, a bit we can say interreligiously, not just in terms of Jews, uh, and I'll get to that in a second, but also in terms of, uh, I think Rafaela mentioned Hinduism. Um, part of the reason uh, why there might be such interesting correspondence between uh, notions of purity and impurity in Hinduism and Zoroastrianism is because um, Iranian culture, uh, uh, before it was, Solely Iranian uh, was part of a larger complex, a reconstructed complex that scholars known as Indo-Iranian. Uh, before the tribe separated, this is going back millennia ago, um, with the Iranian tribes entering onto the plateau and the Indian tribes uh, traveling a bit south um, uh, into areas that we now think of as, as India, um, they were shared society. And one of the fascinating things that we can do in comparative religion when it comes to Zoroastrianism is compare uh, theological ideas, ritual ideas. Um, by the way, the notion of the importance of fire is not limited to Zoroastrianism uh, and, and questions of purity and impurity uh, are shared between these two, um, uh, th these two cultures. So it's, it's wonderful that that was mentioned because on the one hand, when it comes to Zoroastrianism, we, do, we can think of a genetic cousin or relative uh, in terms of his history. When it comes to the encounter between Zoroastrians and uh, Jews, let's say in the Sasanian period of late antiquity, it's a bit more complicated and I think a bit more interesting uh, because on the one hand, these are two cultures that don't share kind of deep roots in the, in the past, right? The Jews are um, uh, have, have a legacy, kind of a Semitic legacy, the languages that they speak, uh, their sacred texts come from a Semitic, you know, more broadly speaking, Near Eastern tradition. Well, the Zoroastrians are coming from a different space, kind of a different, um, uh, different notions uh, of things like purity and impurity. And the question then becomes, what happens when they come together, right? They don't, unlike Afrahat and, um, uh, and the Jews, they do not share a set of sacred scriptures. The Zoroastrians have the Arvesta, the Jews have the Hebrew Bible and related traditions, and yet they share an interest, um, a focus on areas of, of purity. So part of what I've been exploring and others as well uh, is kind of what happens when it's not the shared text, but kind of a shared interest in various ritual matters, right? What happens when they come together? And you'll have to get the book or look at the book to see the details on that. that that's a good promo to your book. Uh, I, what do you, what do we don't know? What 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 are we what do we we what do we wish we could have known, and we don't know, and and I don't know maybe we will in the future, but what's the what's the mysteries we're still looking for? What's the what's the stuff that we're 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 missing to better to really understand uh, the question of the Talmud in light of its non-Jewish world? Yes, yeah, so I mean, we don't know so much. We have um, such a small sliver of material that, you know, that question is like candy for me to imagine all the things we don't know. I'll mention one thing that I would love to know or a, a kind of material that I think would completely change um, what we know. Uh, and that is the world, both for Jews uh, and for non-Jews, let's say Zoroastrians, the world of common religion. 
right? Now I mentioned that the Aramaic incantation bowls on the Jewish side might give us some little window into the beliefs and maybe even the practices of non-rabbinic Jews. But ultimately, right, we have a huge imbalance. On the one hand, the Talmud and the rabbis talk incessantly. I mean, the Talmud is just talking, 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 and giving us fascinating things that largely tell us about rabbinic Judaism. Right, and the world of the rabbis. Sometimes you'll hear a little echo of non-rabbinic Jews, but ultimately they're the loudest voice in that Jewish room. I would love to have more evidence and know, right, on the Jewish side, first of all, um, what life actually was like for your typical Babylonian Jew, right? There's not necessarily reason to assume that your typical Babylonian Jew um, saw themselves as rabbinic at all, saw themselves as, um, you know, looking to the rabbis for how to conduct their religious life. So what was that world like? And by the same token, we can say something similar about, let's say, Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrian texts that have come down to us um, in Middle Persian, first of all, only were put down on paper, the majority of them, after the Sasanian period. This is a problem that uh, scholars um, have been dealing with for, for a long time. Uh, but not only that, they also seem to express a rather official uh, version of the religion, right? This is how kind of officially Zoroastrians should conduct themselves, right? This is officially um, what one should believe, et cetera, et cetera. And in a way that's sort of similar to the very kind of elite um, official take on what, does, what the religion is all about. What would it look like, right, if we had access to um, the world of common Zoroastrianism? Now, here and there, we have little indications. Sometimes we have depictions in Arabic literature, um, you know, early, early Islamic literature that tells us something about non-elite, non-priestly Zoroastrian beliefs. But for them, we really don't have much burial. So the thing that I would love to know most of the many things that we don't know is what actually was happening on the ground, not just with the religious elites, but the more common, you know, common Jews, common Christians, common Zoroastrians. That's what I want to know. Me too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we had a question from Elaine Sloaning that uh, is actually really interesting because you and I, we deal with text, right? We, we, we even the, the incantation bowl that you described, we, we are mostly interested in what's written on them, right? But we, we, we read text. We read the Persian text. We read the Talmud. Uh, what about archaeology? How does archaeology in this area helps us? We know that in, in, in the land of Israel, uh, archaeology is a big advantage and we have... Uh, um, um, a lot of archaeological evidence to help us uh, sift through texts and questions that we're asking. And the more we found, the more questions we have. What about archaeology in this area? What does archaeology in Sura, Pumpadita, in Nehalda, in the other areas, teach us about the Jews in that area? I know the answer, but I'm... I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah, so you... this too, I guess, is something and related to kind of what I would want to know, because I would imagine that if we did have um, archaeological evidence, that we would know quite a bit more about kind of common Jews. But I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question directly and unfortunately negatively. We have virtually no archaeological evidence um, um, regarding specifically Jews. The only archaeological evidence um, we have, in other words, that really come from digs, are some of the incantation bowls, which were written by Jews, and some of them were written for Jews, which were found in situ. Places like Nippur uh, and elsewhere, they give us a little, little sliver of something, uh, archaeologically speaking. But the vast majority of bowls come to us quite problematically, not through archaeological digs. We do not have a single synagogue, though we know there were many synagogues. Uh, we do not have a single synagogue um, that has been archaeologically excavated from the um, from late antique Babylonia. So we're really we're really in the dark when it comes to this this kind of thing. We do have um, a, a a tradition of Sasanian archaeology that at least can give us a sense of what life was like more broadly speaking. In other words, not just for specific communities, but what did neighborhoods look like, or especially 
what did imperial structures and imperial monuments look like? That we have some evidence for. So it's not as if, you know, it's not as if it's entirely archaeologically, archaeological black box, but we don't have those, you know, those fascinating synagogues, let's say, that we have in the Galilee, which have done so much for telling us what life was like for Jews who might not have been, you know, rabbinic. We don't have any of that. And I guess that also would be something I would very much want to have. So we talked about this challenge, right? So the, our challenge is that we don't have archaeology to help us. What other challenges are there? And especially for a scholar such as yourself, right? Groundbreaking, bringing Sasanian culture uh, for the first time to the study of the Talmud. Uh, what are the challenges for someone who's trying to do that? Or let me say as, as well, I can and talk about challenges uh, uh, for me studying uh, the Talmud uh, in light of Christian sources and, and Syriac Christianity or other Christianity, uh, we have special challenges. The Talmud scholars, other Talmud scholars who deal, who do not deal with the non-Jewish background of the Talmud don't face. So what are the challenges that scholars such as ourselves uh, face when we're trying to do this new thing that we're trying to do, which is situation the Talmud in its non-Jewish background? Great. So um, the challenges are many. I'll mention just a couple of them. One of which is um, a relatively or, or a lack of a tra scholarly tradition for doing this kind of work. Right? I actually opened uh, my talk with a contrast between the sort of work that's done with Palestinian rabbinic texts and the kind of work that's done with Babylonian rabbinic texts. The, the field of you know, studying Palestinian rabbinic texts, contextually looking at non-Jewish sources has been developed for a very, very long time. Uh, in the case of trying to contextualize the Talmud, there have been kind of spurts and fits of it, um, even going back to the 19th century, but there isn't really a robust tradition of like, how you do this sort of work, what kind of texts um, um, can be put in conversation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, we, you know, those of us who work and, in, 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 you know, endeavor to contextualize the Talmud, we often feel like we're trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, which, is, which is hard. Related to this, I think, is some resistance on the part of, right, some Talmudists, some scholars, um, even academic scholars, to this sort of work. Um, I mean, I think the resistance is interesting and kind of gets the blood flowing, but it is a challenge. And the resistance partially is based on the lack of scholarly tradition. It's also based on that real sentiment that I also opened with, in which the Talbot presents itself as a kind of self-enclosed world that almost like makes it hard to put it in conversation sometimes uh, with other texts. Um, but also there might even be theological reasons why there's some resistance, even among academics, for putting it in conversation with, uh, with non-rabbinic texts. Like, let's remember, right, the Talmud is, um, in, in many respects, the ground zero of, of Jewish practice, of halakha, of Jewish theology. Uh, it's not some obscure text in the, in, in the canon that you can sort of play games with. People um, feel that the stakes are high, and sometimes... Um, people feel that if you show influence, if you show that what's happening in the Talmud actually relates in some way to these non-rabbinic worlds, these non-Jewish worlds, that can be threatening, right? That can be problematic for people religiously or even scholastically. So that's all part of a challenge, I think, in terms of, you know, resistance to this work. The last thing I'll mention is just... Um, the nature of the sources, right? Some of these texts are um, particularly the Middle Persian text, but not only um, Manichaean as well, are written in very, very fragmentary sort of evidence. Uh, some of them are quite, some of the, uh, some of the sources are quite late. Um, some of the manuscripts are worm eaten. Uh, it's just, it, 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 it's not the same as sort of picking off a, a, a volume from the Loeb Classical Library where all of the philological work has been done for you more or less, and you just have to put it in conversation. There's a lot of kind of grunt work that needs to happen in terms of reading these other sources and making sense of them. That's also a challenge, an invigorating one, but it is a challenge. I was sure the first thing you're gonna mention is the language, which you didn't, but per Middle Persian, the <laughs> language obviously is, is a huge challenge, right? Very few people, know how to read Middle Persian. And, and I know the, the, 
the the length of, of, of effort that you have made to study this uh, uh, language with very few people who can teach it and who can read it and even though even they have a very hard time uh, reading these texts which by the way when looking at the Christian sources I, I have I have a better time because uh, uh, Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic that's very close to the dialect in which the Babylonian Talmud is written so uh, or composed uh, so, uh, in fact, the Christian sources are much more accessible That's than right. the Persian sources, or not to speak of the other sources in the area, as the Manichaean texts and and, the, and Coptic texts and others. So, the language barrier is a uh, is a huge uh, uh, challenge as well, um, and right. especially when we're trying to not only understand the basic text but compare texts from different languages and different. Uh, uh, um, terminology, etc. So I would say that this, uh, I thought that was going to be your first answer, but uh, uh, you went a different route. Um, uh, some people are asking about the nature. So what's the content when we're talking about the relationship between the text? So I'm, I'm mostly looking at a question uh, from Professor Sylvian uh, Kappel uh, that's asking about um, ethical discourse and how much uh, uh, from the so when we're looking when we're looking at the to, to categorize right the influences and the connection between the texts, how much of it is ethical, how much of it is theological, how much is it about praxis, how much is it about I don't know liturgy. So so what do we know so far? So first of all, it's great to hear see that people I know are participating. Hi, Cillian. <laughs> Um, so um, I'll speak specifically about the Zoroastrian texts, and um, uh, I'll say that there's actually quite a variety in, in, in terms of the genres and the, and the type of material we have. Uh, a lot of the material, um, certainly that I've gravitated towards, is um, kind of scholastic ritual, looks something like halachic discourse. Um, and the reason why I've gravitated towards that is because it does seem so familiar, um, so similar to the world of the rabbis. And that is a significant component of, of the, the material. And I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, and comparative work to be done uh, there. But we also have all sorts of texts. I think the next kind of most important component is theological. We have quite a bit of theological treatises that lay out Zoroastrian theology in various ways. Um, this could be, um, uh, for example, as a cosmology. In fact, uh, uh, a few months ago, I participated in a forum at the National Library uh, that celebrated the publication of a book by Domenico Agostini and Sam Thrope from the National Library. Um, uh, in addition and translation, I should say, of a cosmological text known as the And those cosmological texts um, present in a very interesting way uh, theology, right? What's the relationship between good and evil? What's the relationship between these different uh, forces? We also have theological texts that are in kind of question answers, right? Someone will ask a question, a theological question, and there'll be a theological uh, response. Then kind of a third component, and I'll kind of leave it at that, even though we could go on, is advice literature. Um, the advice literature is really interesting. <clears throat> I actually think that quite a bit of work could be done um, relating that and using that to think more deeply about, um, about Jews and Babylonian Jews in the Talmud. The advice literature <clears throat> sometimes is like a mirror for princes, right? This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself if you're part of the, uh, part of the court, but it's also ethics, right? It's also, this is the way to lead a, a proper life. Um, this is the way to be successful, right? Almost like self-help literature. <laughs> because it is so, you know, like self-help literature in the everyday. Um, and like the typical concerns of people, um, it's a really interesting story. And I think we'll shed quite a bit um, on all those passages in the Talmud that are also very self-helpy. This is what you should eat. This is what you shouldn't eat, right? This is um, this is how you should conduct yourself and this is how you should not conduct yourself. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. I would say that uh, in, in, in regard to that question, that um, I, we, we see something very similar when we're talking about Christian literature, that the, 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 the width and, and the richness of the connection with the Christian tradition always surprised me. 
that it really comes in all in all shapes and all sizes in, in the ethical in the practice in the we just have to dig more and what I feel when I'm doing this and I'm, I'm, I think shy and I share this feeling that because we're you know the first generations of scholars who are looking at uh, at, at these materials and you kind of feel like a discoverer of new lands uh, it's exciting and it's fun but it's also scary because we we don't know if what we're, we're looking at is representative of the whole of what we'll find at the end of the road or is it just you know and an anomaly that we, we just, you know, found some examples and they're not representative. So it's hard to commit to this. But from everything we see, I think uh, we both share this sense of richness of what there is to find in that conversation between the religions and between communities that created those texts side by side in those crucial years of the formation uh, of the Talmud and, and the religion, other religions side by side, and uh, especially the Persian and the Christian communities. Um, thank you, Shai. I think that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, lecture and so clear and really focused on, on the central issues. And I'm, I'm very happy you, uh, you agreed to participate. I want to uh, thank you all for attending and asking wonderful questions and, and really being with us today. And please join me in, in thanking Shai for this wonderful lecture. Uh, Tad? Yes, I'm joining you, Shai, really. Uh, thank you very much. It was really great, uh, clear, and very, uh, very educational. Thank you, Michal, as well, for wonderful moderation, as usual. Thank you again. Have a wonderful and calm uh, evening here in Jerusalem, Israel, and afternoon in United States. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michal.